Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Pearlside this morning. Thank you for being in the house on the first day of NFL football season. You are here. Give yourselves a hand. Amen. <laughs> I just want to say to all those that are watching online and I'm watching church live, but got football on the other screen, um, your team's going to lose. I'm just saying. And if you're checking the fantasy scores, your fantasy team's going to lose. I just want to say. I said that in the last service and someone texted me after. My team's losing. I know because you're at home. So <laughs> uh, anyway, but no, thank you for being in the house and for making room for God. You know, one of the, you know, can God move when you were watching the church at home? Absolutely. But he's so much powerful when we're here in this place together. Amen. Uh, the manifest presence of God is there. Just one quick testimony on that. Last week, Sunday, uh, after the worship, I think it was Pastor Kalai prayed for people that need healing. And if you were here, maybe you, you were a part of that. But a lady was here and she walked in with crutches because she had a back injury. God touched her, and she walked out carrying her crutches in her hand. Amen? God's presence is, where, 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 when the people are present, God's presence is manifest. And so can God heal you at home? Sure he can. But will he? I don't think so. He wants you to be in church. Amen. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I don't know. God can do whatever he wants to do, but, but it is definitely, Scripture says to don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. But thank you for being in the house this morning and uh, for, for continuing this series with us. Real quick, I just want to say thank you for continuing to be generous uh, with the, the Maui Relief. Up to date, to date, we have cut together, raised, and given $206,235. Wow. Give yourselves a hand. Come on. Praise God. And all of that money, as we said, went to our church in Maui, and, and they've been distributing all of it. They're not keeping it. There's no administrative costs. It's all going to the hands of people. I was there, part of that, uh, delivering funds and relief to, to families. And I know it's all going into the hands of those that need it. So thank you for being the church, being generous, and continuing to love above and beyond the tithe and giving to be, to, to be a blessing to others. And, and just, just a quick teaser, next week, Sunday, uh, Pastor Jonathan Asato, who is the lead pastor of our church on Maui, is going to be here and he's going to be sharing the word and he's going to be sharing updates and testimonies because from day one he's been on the ground uh, being a part of the relief efforts and so he's got a lot of testimonies of God working behind the scenes so he's going to share the word next week so you're going to want to be in the house he's a great preacher and he's got uh, amazing testimonies he's going to share with us so quick teaser there amen well crisis reminds us how important family is and how important it is to build families on the firm foundation so that it can weather whatever storms of life are coming. Because whether it's the disaster on Maui or, not, you know, disasters around the world or just in our own personal lives, there are crises that's going to come. How do we build our ohanas and our families in a way that thrives in the midst of a world filled with crisis? As we said last week, we live in a broken world where sin and disease and disaster abounds. But God has called us to thrive in the midst of that. How do we build our lives personally and our families to withstand? All of us want families that grow and withstand the, the storms of life. How do we build that? In 1173, 1173, the construction of the bell tower in Pisa began. And all of us know this now as the leaning tower of Pisa. But initially, it was, it was to be the tallest building in the area and a symbol of prosperity and strength for that maritime city. It was, it was meant to be you know, a, a monument to the greatness of that city. However... The builders failed to consider the foundation. Due to the underground water level, the builders were unable to dig a foundation deep enough to support the structure. And they didn't realize that the ground that they were building on was made up of fine clay, whoa, made up of fine clay, sand, and shells. Not exactly the foundation you want to be building a house on, let alone a tower that's supposed to be tall and weighs a lot. <laughs> so, obviously... As they began to build and the weight of the structure was put on that, that weak foundation, it began to sink. So to compensate for the sinking on one side, they thought, well, we'll build that part of the, the, the tower taller than the other side. So they, they added inches to one side to hopefully compensate for the lean. Unfortunately, they added weight to that, caused it to sink even more. And after over a decade and over $24 million, which was a lot of money in 1173 A.D., they finally abandoned the project, realizing that we can't repair this thing because it's built on a faulty foundation. And now rather than a monument to the greatness and the prosperity and the strength of Pisa and its builders, it is now a monument to poor planning and failure. And I think that's a parable for all of our lives, isn't it? 
we can, if, if the foundation that we're building upon isn't steady, isn't set, isn't firm, we can spend a lot of time, we can spend a lot of energy, we can spend a lot of money, and it's still going to be faulty. No matter what we do, if we build upon a faulty foundation, it's not going to be the, it's not going to end up at the result that we want. And the foundation that God calls all of us to build our lives upon is the foundation of God's word. It's the foundation of his word. Jesus said it. But we need to build our lives, not on the sand, but on the foundation, the rock of Jesus Christ and his word. And if we don't build on the foundation of God's word, any techniques that we try to add, whether it's to marriage, whether it's to family, or even our success in business and in life, if it's not built on the foundation of the word, it's going to sink at some point in time. So that's what we want to talk about here this morning as we continue this series, is that the word of God must be our foundation. The word of God must be our foundation. Whether you're single, whether you're married, whether you have kids or you don't, every one of us need to build our lives on the firm foundation of God's word. We're going to take a look back at the text that we looked at last week, Genesis chapter 2 and 3. And we're going to look at the first family and how God designed that family to be, but also how Satan came to attack it. And we're going to extract some principles together on how we can build our lives on the firm foundation of the word of God. Genesis chapter 2, starting in verse 16, after God created Adam and Eve, placed them in this perfect garden, called them to live forever with him in perfect relationship with himself and one another. This is what, 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 what transpired. Verse 16, and the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree in the, of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat from it, you will certainly die. Or the original language would say, you are doomed to die. You are destined to die. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden. But God did say you must not eat from the fruit, fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden. And you must not touch it or you will die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Can we pray this morning as we unpack the word? Father, we thank you that you gave us your word to reveal to us who you are and your plans and the purposes that you have for our lives. I pray by the whole, we invite the Holy Spirit to come, to guide us, to guide our hearts and our minds in what you want to say to us this morning. We surrender ourselves to you Heavenly Father, speak to us by your spirit, we pray in Jesus' name, amen and amen. There's a lot to unpack from this text, but one of the first things that I'd like us to see is right after God created and blessed mankind, Satan came and attacked. Satan always comes to attack families. Don't think that your family is exempt. Every single one of our families are going to be attacked by the enemy. And just as God is real, our enemy, the devil, is equally real. And so are demons and demonic forces. In fact, in the month of October, we're going to unpack the realities of the spiritual battle that we're in as we get ready for Halloween and our Seek Week prayer and fasting because there's a very real spiritual battle and very real demonic forces that war against us. Now, we don't need to be afraid of them. When we understand who we are and the authority that we have in Christ, there's nothing to be afraid of because greater is he who lives in us, amen, than he who is in the world. But yet we can't be ignorant of what the devil is doing. And so we're going to unpack that in the month of October. So don't skip town. You're not going to want to miss that. But what we see here from the very beginning, the first family was attacked by the enemy and the enemy came to deceive and to undermine God's authority. And that's what he always does. And so the first thing we see that the enemy did is he came to undermine the authority of God. I think it's very interesting here that in the, in the text in Genesis, whenever God is referred to, it says the Lord God. You see that the very first verse there, verse 16, it says, and the Lord God commanded the man. Whenever you see the word Lord God put together, in the original language, the original Hebrew, it's the word Yahweh, which is the name of God. God's name is Yahweh. It's, it's the name that, you know, it's, it's just the, the Hebrew syllables, but it, it's, it refers to the creator God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, Yahweh. It says, and the Lord God commanded the man. However, when Satan comes now, he doesn't use the name Yahweh. He says, did God, and he uses the word Elohim. Now, this is important because Elohim also refers to lesser gods, false gods, other gods. So it's just the generic lowercase g God, right? So it says, the Lord God, Yahweh, commanded the man. But Satan said, did Elohim really say? What's he doing? He's diminishing God's authority. He is not the creator God. He's just any other God. 
and he's diminishing his authority. So much so that when Eve replies to Satan, he says, well, yeah, God, Elohim did say. Even she gets confused about the Lord's authority. There's a diminishing of the authority of God. What this would be like, it's kind of like if you ever, you remember when you were back in school, and let's say your teacher's name was Mrs. Jones or whatever, and there's always that one student that calls her by her first name, right? Hey, Susan, why I gotta do this, yeah? There's always that one, you know, that tries to t test the teacher by calling her by her first name, you know what I'm saying? It's diminishing authority. Or those of you, before you proposed to your wife, you called your future father-in-law Bob, you know what I'm saying, instead of Mr. whatever. It's a diminishing of authority. And that's what Satan does here to God. He's not the high God full of authority. He's just a God with a opinion. You don't have to listen to him. And that subtle diminishing of God's authority can bring confusion and gets us to diminish his word. And how many times we recognize in our lives the enemy's trying to diminish the authority of God? Did God really say, do you really have to listen to that? Does that really matter? Is it really that important? Diminishing God's authority. The enemy always comes to do that. And then he also comes to deceive with partial truths. He says, did God, Elohim, really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Well, of course, Satan knows exactly what God said, but he's trying to confuse Eve. Wait, did he? I don't know. Did he really? I'm not sure now. Now, the Bible is very clear. God said, no, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden. Satan goes, did he say? Yeah. You're, he said that we're free to eat from any tree in the garden, just not the fruit of the knowledge of the tree of good and evil. And Eve gets confused here. Because her reply is, you must, he, God said, we must not eat fruit from the tree that's in the middle of the garden, and we must not touch it. Now, did God say the fruit tree in the middle and that we can't touch it? No, he did not. And that subtle distortion of God's word confused her to the point where she questioned its authority, and she wasn't sure what she was supposed to do. Now, whether she was confused before or confused after, either way, Satan told a half-truth to get her confused. By the way, whenever someone tells you a half-truth, you know they're lying. Isn't that true? It's kind of like when I, when I come home, you know, ask my kids, hey, did you do your chores? Yeah. And then one child says, well, I took out the trash. That wasn't the question. I said, do you, did you do your chores? Plural. And if you're going to tell me a half truth that, oh, I took out the trash, that immediately tells me you didn't do the other three things you're supposed to do. Because otherwise you would have said yes. Right? All the parents, you know what I'm talking about? See, when we tell a half truth, it's meant to deceive us. Oh, good. You took out the trash. And I forgot that I told you three other things. And now you're off the hook, right? The half-truth is, is it, whenever someone tells you a half-truth, you got to know that they're already lying. It's, 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 it's a fundamental part of uh, tactic and manipulation and gaslighting. And so Satan does this. Pastor Clyde pointed this out to me that of the 320 words that Satan spoke in the Bible, someone actually did this research, pretty cool, 173 of them are lies, which means 147 of them are true. Does Satan sometimes tell the truth? Yes. But more than often, he tells lies. And sometimes just that half-truth gets us confused enough to doubt the word of God and to question it and to get off track. And that's what we see here happening. Did God really say? And it confuses Eve enough that she doesn't even remember what God said anymore. It's so important that we know exactly what the word says. Not partial truths, not half-truths, not someone's opinion on it. And that's why as we're, well, I'm getting ahead of myself. We got to read it. We got to study it. We got to know it. Because if we get off track and we start building our lives on anything other than the word of God, it's going to be a shaky foundation. Like the Tower of Pisa, it's going to sink at some point. And we're going to try all kinds of things to compensate. But if the word isn't the foundation, it's not going to last. And it's not going to build the way that God has called us to. He deceived her also by suggesting that God is holding out on her. Look at what he said. For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Again, a half truth. The irony is they are, were already made in the image of God. They were already like God. And God already declared everything to be very good. So they already knew what good was. And he tempted that, her, her to say, but do you want to know what evil is too? He's holding out on you by not wanting to know evil. Now, question, why would you want to know what evil is? Why would you want to know what death is like or disease is like or disaster is like? Why would you want to know that? But you see that subtle manipulation got her to go, oh, maybe God's holding out on me. Maybe he's trying to keep me from something in life. And that began the deception that led her astray. And one of the things Satan always tries to do is to tempt us, to lie to us, that God is trying to restrict you from full, full self-actualization, from fully enjoying the pleasures of this life. He's trying to hold you back. He's trying to restrict you. Now, all of us don't like restrictions. Isn't that true? I don't like restrictions. 
But do we realize that sometimes those restrictions are there for our protection? For example, all of us, those of you that drove here today, did any of you get mad at the lines on the road? Like, how dare you tell me I can't cross that double saw the line? I feel like I should be able to cross that double saw line. Why? How dare you tell me red means stop? What if I want red to mean go, right? And we get mad at the restrictions because those are restrictions, aren't they? But all of us recognize that those restrictions are there for what? For our protection. If you want to decide that red means go instead of stop, you're going to get hurt and you'll probably hurt somebody else. It's not to prevent us from enjoying life. It's to preserve life so that we can enjoy it to its fullest. Those double solid lines aren't meant to keep us in line like robots. They're meant to protect us from getting hit by oncoming cars. Amen? Those restrictions are there for our protection and for our joy. So is the word of God. It's not there to restrict us, to keep us from enjoying life. It's to protect us so that we don't experience the evil that happens when we cross the solid line or we run the red light. Those restrictions are there to protect us, but Satan told a half-truth. He doesn't want you to know evil. Yeah, of course he doesn't want you to know evil. I don't want my kids to know evil, and neither neither did God want us to. And as we saw last week, because they chose to cross the solid line, evil entered in and death entered in. But the enemy is always trying to diminish the the word, the authority of the word, so that we cross the lines we're not supposed to cross. And then we experience the evil that we're not supposed to experience. The death, the disease, the disaster, the brokenness in relationships, the depression, the anxiety, the this, the that, the other thing, we can go down the list. When we cross the lines of the word, that's what's going to happen. And so first and foremost, the word needs to be our foundation. And then secondly, the word must be our authority. Now, none of us like the word authority, but again, if we think of it in terms of control, then yes. But the word is not meant to control us. It's meant to protect us from the evil that is outside of those lines. And what happened here, verse 6 of Genesis chapter 3, when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and she ate it. What happened here? She decided for herself that the fruit was good. Even though God said not to do it, she saw for herself and decided for herself. In that moment, she became an authority unto herself. She became her own Elohim. She became her own God, elevated herself to the status of who gets to make the calls and the authority of God. She decided for herself. And that's what Satan always does to us. Deceives us and says, decide for yourself. Don't submit to the authority of the word. Did God really say? You decide for yourself. And isn't that the mantra of our generation? Decide for yourself. Be your own person, right? Do whatever feels good, right? Whatever, whatever. you know, we think to ourselves, you know, what could possibly be wrong? It looks so good. How can something that feels so good be so wrong, right? And all those thoughts go through our head where we begin to, again, diminish the authority of the word. And then we cross the double solid lines and experience the consequences of our sin. The mantra of our age, every pop song, every music video, every every movie that we watch is trying to tell us, feed your flesh. Do what feels good, right? Don't, don't follow restrictions. Break those restrictions. I think it's interesting that the golden rule in the church of Satan is do what thou wilt. Do what thou wilt. Break every restriction. Break off every barrier. Feed your flesh. Live for pleasure. And Satan is always throwing that in there. And when we decide for ourselves, rather than checking with the word of God and surrendering to its authority, we're giving in to the enemy's temptations, the same temptation that was there in the garden. Now, we like to blame Eve, or people that tend to blame Eve for this because it was the woman that did it first. But I love how it's very clear here. She gave some to her husband who was with her. So Adam was right there, and he didn't step in. He didn't step in to lead. God gave the word to Adam. Either he didn't teach her right or he, and, and or he didn't protect her in that moment. I don't know what he was doing. Maybe he was watching football, you know. Maybe he was checking his fantasy scores. I don't know what he was doing. Like some of you right now, you're watching me and you're also watching football on the side. I know NFL red zone is tempting. I get it, okay, but you know, right? I don't know what he was doing, but he certainly wasn't doing his job. And so we can blame Eve all we want. It's really Adam's fault because the word came to Adam first. But either way, if we don't surrender and and uphold the authority of the word of God, we're building on a faulty foundation. And I know even right now, some of you are wrestling with this. It's hard. I get it. Because there's a lot of things in the Bible that I wrestle with that it's hard to accept. But we have to, at the end of the day, come to the conclusion, no, it's your word. It doesn't matter how I feel about it. It doesn't matter what I think about it. 
What matters is that you said it, it's your word, and I surrender to it. Because if there is no God, then it makes sense. Do whatever you want. Do what feels good. Live for pleasure. Live for yourself. Decide for yourself. We're all Elohims <laughs> if there is no God. But if there is a God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, and if there is a God who gave us his word, if there is a God who sent his son Jesus to live the life we should have lived, die the death that we should have died, if there is a God who raised him up on the third day after he died on the cross, then we have to surrender to his authority and to not to our own. Can I hear an amen to that? So what about, what about people who say, well, the Bible was just written by men, you know? The Bible was just written by the church and, and altered by the church to manipulate and control people. How many of you have ever heard that argument? I hear that argument every now and then. Uh, let, let me just give us really quickly a couple of thoughts on that. First of all, ancient manuscripts dating back to before Christ validate the Bible that we have today is true. That, that it's, it wasn't altered by men. It wasn't altered by the church Secondly, Jesus Christ, the living word, attested to the word of God, and the New Testament is his words, attested by his apostles. And then thirdly, his resurrection proved that he was God and that he had the authority of God and the words of God lived in him. And so, and so therefore, we can trust the word because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Let me give you a couple of books. I'm not going to give it to you, but let me, let me throw you up a couple of books to, that if you are, those of you that are inclined and you'd like to know more, because I know many of you are, go and throw up that slide. The first one is this, I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist by Norman Geisler and Frank Turek. Really great book. I started into it, um, but I've heard them speak on this issue many times. And one of the chapters specifically addresses the authority of the word of God and proofs and why we can trust his authority, some of which I highlighted just now. And the second one is Body of Proof by Dr. Jeremiah Johnson, where he highlights 10 uh, reasons why we can trust that the resurrection of Jesus Christ happened. And again, why is this important? Because if Jesus rose from the dead, it proves that he was who he said he was and that his word is the word of God and authoritatively so, because he called his shot. He said, I'm going to be killed and I'm going to be raised on the third day. Nobody does that. Okay, so Body of Proof is a really great one. I finished it a little while ago, and uh, for those of you who like to read, for those of you who don't like to read, you can look them up on YouTube. They talk about it a lot, so you can cheat that way. Amen. All right, but the authority of the word is so important, and Satan always comes to diminish it. He diminishes it in our, our hearts, and our minds, getting us to say, no, I should decide for myself. I like a lot of what the Bible says, but this one, I don't know about that. I'm going to cross that out, or I'm going to not obey that, and we diminish the word of God. You know that we're, we're not supposed to do that. Either it's all true or it's not. Either it is the word of God or it's not. And if it is the word of God, then we have to obey it 100% because it's the authority, has the authority of God himself. You know, the Communist Chinese Party, some of you may have seen this over the last few years, has been rewriting the Bible. Because if you, if you, know, this, if you know what's going on, the, the underground church in China is exploding. People are getting saved by the millions. And the church in China poses a great threat to the Chinese Communist Party. And if you know anything about the Chinese Communist Party, they want control. They want to run everyone's lives. And so the church poses a threat. It's illegal to own an unauthorized Bible in China. It's, un it's illegal to have Bible apps on your phone. You know how we have apps on our phone that have like a gajillion Bible translations, including Pigeon English? You should go read that one day. It's a trip. But anyway, we can have that. No problem. You can go online. You can, you can Google Bible and you can read it. In China, you can't. It's illegal. If you have a Bible app on your phone, they will arrest you and or fine you, probably both. And if you, have a, if you have a paper Bible, you can be arrested, especially if it's the unauthorized. So what they're doing now, because the church continues to grow, is they're editing the Bible to diminish God's authority and saying that's the only version of the Bible you can own. So they can say, no, we're not banning Bibles. We have our own authorized version. The problem with that is it diminishes the authority of God. For example, it makes Jesus out to be a murderer. So you remember that story where Jesus says that him without sin cast the first stone and he forgives the woman caught in adultery? Well, they rewrote it to say, well, I too am a sinner. And then he goes and stones the woman, makes her, him out to be a murderer. And then he claims himself to be a sinner, all diminishing his authority. Because if you can diminish the authority of Christ, you diminish the authority of his word, then there is no authority other than the Communist Party. Why is this important? See, now we all look at that and we go, that's crazy. Man, that's horrible. They should never do that. Editing the Bible. Doesn't Revelation say if you edit the Bible, you're cursed? Yes, it does. We do that as well. When we read the Bible and we go, I don't know if I agree with that. I'm going to reword that to say what I want it to say. I don't know if I agree with that. And we won't actually edit and publish our own version, but we just kind of cross it out in our heart, cross it out in our mind, go, I like these 95 things, but not this one. 
and we decide for ourselves. That's what Eve did. I don't like that you say that, God. I see that it's good for food and pleasing to the eye. I'm going to decide for myself. It's kind of the same thing as editing the Bible, just on a smaller scale. And all of us in our hearts wrestle with that. All of us have something in Scripture that, 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 that wars with our wills. Can I encourage you? You're not alone. But we all have to come before God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, and say, it's not about what I will. It's about what you will. It's not about my opinion. It's about your opinion. doesn't matter how I feel about this. What matters is what you say about this. And we have good evidence that says the Bible has been true yesterday, today, and it will be forever. Let me give you an example of one of the ones that challenge many people today and maybe some of you in this room. As it, and it relates to family. Ephesians 5, 21 to 22 tells us, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. That sounds good. But verse 22 is where people get kind of hung up and beyond. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. Ooh, I don't like that. Verse 25, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Ooh, I don't like that. Sacrifice? Dying to myself? Mm. Each one of you must also love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must, must respect her husband. We struggle with that. Modern readers look at this and say, well, that's old-fashioned. I don't know if I agree with this anymore. And I understand that thinking, but is it old-fashioned or is it original? Is it old-fashioned or is it a reflection of how God designed humanity to be? And how's it been going ever since we departed from this? Not so well. This is the way that God designed it. Whether we like it or not, whether we agree with it or not, we need to surrender to it. And there are a lot of times people look at the Bible, this verse and many others, and say, well, what about all the people that have abused that and done it wrong and controlled people and, you know, whatever? Has that happened? Sadly, it has. But can I give you an example? Because a lot of people like to use bad Christian examples as a reason why they don't want to obey the Bible. Because people abuse that, I'm going to throw the whole thing out. Let me give you an example of why that's kind of silly. Have you ever gone to a wedding and you heard someone singing cover songs? Yeah? You guys ever seen, or go to, go to a restaurant or bar, right, and they're singing cover songs? Have you ever heard someone sing a cover song badly? Like I was at a wedding once and this dude was trying to sing Bruno Mars, Talking to the Moon. Talking to the moon. Oh, it was painful. It was so painful. I was just like, oh God, please stop. You're, you can't do the falsetto. You're not Bruno. Stop, okay? Now, did I in that moment blame Bruno Mars for his horrible performance? No, it's not Bruno's fault that this dude can't sing. You know what I'm saying? And did I say I am never listening to Bruno Mars again because this dude ruined it for me forever? No, I want to actually play the song to get the horrible sound out of my ear. I want to hear it right. You know what I'm saying? But that's what we do to the word of God. You're performing the scripture badly. So God, this is your fault. You're per that person over there is performing it badly. They're using it wrong, so I'm going to throw it out. No, no, no. Just because they're doing a bad job of it doesn't mean that there's something wrong with God and there's something wrong with the word. I have, I have my daughters now in orchestra, and I know I'm going to have to listen to bad Beethoven and bad Bach. I'm sure of it. Now, is it Beethoven's fault that these seventh graders can't play it well? Nah. Is there something wrong with the music? No. Is there something wrong with the sheet music that they're following? No, there isn't. They just don't know how to play it right. But yet we want to take the Bible and chuck it because some Christians don't do it right. And we want to look at God and say, you're wrong because some Christians don't play the music the way that it's supposed to be played. That's a logical fallacy. But yet we do it to God. The reality is there's nothing wrong with his word. We just don't play it right. <laughs> there's nothing wrong with his word. We just don't perform it. And I use performing air quotes because we're not performing. But you get my point. We're not performing it the way that the author intended it to be performed. Bruno, if he heard that dude sing, he probably, probably get off the stage. You're killing me right now. And I think sometimes when God sees the way that we poorly live out his word, he's like, dude, are you serious? That's why I sent my son Jesus to save you because bruh, right? So when we see things in the word and we think of bad examples of how people have done it wrong, don't throw out the word. There's nothing wrong with the word. That person just didn't practice enough. And there's nothing wrong with God. All of us have seen bad Christian examples. People using scriptures as, scripture as weapons rather than letting it change themselves first. That doesn't mean there's anything wrong with the word. Can I hear an amen to that? But here's what Satan does. He loves to throw in a lie. See? See? Those people did it, lived it out wrong. So, hey, you know, must throw it out. Don't even listen. Don't even go to church. There's no God because look at how these people play it. No. We're just bad cover artists. <laughs> the true artist 
got it right, and his name is Jesus Christ. And we got to just practice like heck so that we don't keep on failing. There's nothing wrong with the word. And we need to allow the word to be our authority because it is true. And there's a lot of things in the word that says that, that we need to apply to our lives. However, the problem, though, is the Bible doesn't directly speak to every single issue. For example, does the Bible say how we ought to, to use social media explicitly? No, it doesn't, because social media didn't exist in the time of the biblical authors. So we can go, well, I guess the Bible has nothing to say about social media use or whatever, or the internet. No, The Bible provides us a frame. It's like a frame. The truths and the principles in Scripture provide a frame. And we apply the truth of that frame to whatever issue is outside of that frame. So, for example, how, does the, how could the Bible apply to our social media use? Well, the Bible is very clear. It says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. It also says whatever is true and noble and right and pure, lovely and admirable, excellent and praiseworthy, think about such things. So, for example, if that's the frame, love the Lord your God and think about pure, noble, praiseworthy things, does my social media use help me to do those things in that frame? That, that's an open-ended question because it may, but it also may not. So I need to now pull whatever that is into the boundaries of that frame to make sure that it's within the word of God. Are you following what I'm saying? Because if, if, if my social media use and the people that I'm following is getting me to think about things that aren't lovely, praiseworthy, then I need to adjust. If it's getting me to, if it's hindering my ability to love God and love others, then I need to make adjustments. You see that? It doesn't directly express social media or whatever, but it does give us a frame for us to view anything in life by. The question I have for us this morning, because I know for many of you, you're like, man, you're preaching to the choir. I get it, Pastor. But for many of us this morning, are there areas in our lives that we haven't put under the authority of God's word? All of us have them. Maybe it's the way that we conduct business. Oh, it's just a little bit of cheating here. It's just a little bit of fudging of the numbers there. It's just a little white lie there. Maybe it's the way that we treat our spouses. It's just a little bit of disrespect. It's just a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Maybe it's in the things that we look at on social media. It's just a little bit of sin. It's just a little bit of pornography. And we adjust the word of God to make it palatable to us. It's the same thing that the Communist Chinese Party is doing, except we don't publish those edited Bibles. We keep it in our hearts. But that's the one that we live by. All of us have one or two that we wrestle with. Maybe it's the one I just read about honoring your husbands, wives. And maybe it's the one about sub, sub, uh, serving and sacrificing for your families, husbands. What is it? We all have them. And this isn't to make us feel guilty, but it's to call our attention so that we can surrender to the word of God together. Can I hear an amen? Maybe it's about being generous. Maybe it's about being patient. Maybe it's about forgiveness. I know the Bible talks about forgiveness a whole lot, but surely, God, you don't mean forgive that person. Right? We edit the word to make it mean what we want it to mean so that we can feel good. We can't do that. God's word is God's word. And that's why, go ahead and throw up that slide of our, our, our books we have, we have our one-to-one -one book. We have the Purple book. We have the Purpose Driven Life book. These are resources that we encourage everyone to go through, either with someone or on your own, because it helps us to get the word into our lives. And we don't make many, any money on these. You just go on Amazon and get it for yourself. But these are resources for us. It's why they're so important. It's why we have our classes, like our growth track, our, our Freedom Weekends, our discipleship track, which, by the way, if you haven't gone through recently, I want to encourage you to go through it. And many times we say, you know, I, I went through that back in 1998 or 2003, whatever. Can I tell you, after having taught these classes now for over 20 years, every single time I study to teach them again, I learn something new myself. Or the Lord reminds something and applies it to where I am now. Because what I learned back when I was 18 is very different now that I'm 43 and I have a teenager in my own life. It's different. Our life face changes and the word of God applies a little bit differently. Am I saying you got to go every year? No, I'm not saying that. But every now and then, it's good to get a refresher so that the Word of God can be the frame and the foundation, right? It's why we have our Life Matters courses like uh, Celebrate Recovery, our, our marriage huddles, our parenting huddles, financial peace, all about laying a foundation of the Word in the different arenas in our life. We say, and, and all of this is to support our small group ministry because it's in the small groups that we walk these things out, where we, we, this, it, it's all very nuanced, right? So how do you apply that? We learn from other people how you apply that. We also can learn from others' mistakes. And when I didn't do this right, this is what happened. Okay, I don't want to repeat that mistake, right? It's so that we can together grow in making sure that the word is our authority and our foundation. So again, here's my question to us as we get ready to close. What area of your life do you wrestle with the word? And maybe you've been editing it subtly in your heart. We need to surrender, not to what we want it to say, but to what it actually says. 
not what we want it to mean, but what God actually meant in his word. And then, we, and then lastly, we close with this. Because when we obey God's word, God blesses. God blesses. I love what it says here in Joshua chapter 1, verse 8. <clears throat> this is God speaking to the, then, the now leader of the nation of Israel. He says, keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then, everybody say then. Then you will be prosperous and successful. When we keep the book of the law, the word of God, always on our lips, meditating on it day and night. Now, that's a, that's a metaphor. Obviously, we're not always just speaking the word of God, but it's always present in our minds. It's always present in our consciousness. We, that's why we got to read it. We have to take time to, to get it into us on a daily basis and then meditate on it so that we can do it. Because the word is not just meant to be known, it's meant to be applied. And as we do it, the promise of God is prosperity and success in our lives, in our families, in our marriages, in our homes. And I know many of you may have come, came to church this morning thinking we're going to learn principles about godly families and marriages. We'll get to that in the coming weeks. But the most important principle is the foundation has to be on the word. Is the, is the word the foundation first in our hearts? Because if it's not in me as an individual, then it's not going to be the foundation in my marriage, right? And if the word isn't the foundation in my marriage, then it's not going to be the foundation for my children. And if it's not foundational in my children, then it's not going to be foundational in my home. And then how can the word of God spread from my home to the neighbors beyond me and my family, my coworkers, and beyond? Because so goes the family, so goes the community, so goes the neighborhood, the city, the nation, and the world. It starts with you and me. And we can look at all that's going wrong in the world and say, those, those goofballs need to fix stuff. But it starts with us. We need to first lay the right foundation in our own lives. Can I hear an amen to that? And may we love the word of God, hunger for the word of God, be passionate for the word of God, the way that God has called us to. Just as much as the Communist, Church, uh, Communist Party in China is editing the Bible, there is such a hunger for the word in China. They love the word of God. Some people only have pages of the Bible that they hide under bricks and hide under places so that when they get raided, it's not found. And I want to close with this. Missionaries smuggle Bibles into China all the time. I have friends that were part of missionaries smuggling Bibles into China. I had one that was just telling me recently back in when he was in, you know, doing this before that he got arrested and had guns pointed at his head. It's a whole long story. But this is a video I want to show you of missionaries who brought Bibles to an underground church in China. And I want you to see the hunger that these people have for the word of God. And may we hunger for God's word like them. Take a look at this. May we hunger for the word like them. How many of us have Bibles that are collecting dust on a shelf somewhere? Some of us have apps on our phones that we never open. We have access unprecedented to the treasure of God's word. But we don't treasure it in our own hearts like we should. So Father, forgive us. Father, forgive us for treating your word like a casual thing. You've given us a tremendous gift to escape the death and the curse of sin in this world. But we hunger for so many other things, to be distracted, to be entertained, to have our pleasures met. That Sometimes we don't want to open the Bible because we know it's going to tell us what we don't want to hear. 
Father, forgive us. Forgive us for just wanting techniques to make our marriages better and our families better, how to parent our kids, but we don't want your word because we don't want your authority sometimes. Father, forgive us. Father, forgive me for thinking I know better than you and wanting to do things my way rather than searching out your heart through your word. Help us to hunger. Help us to be humble like our brothers and sisters around the world that would kill to have the access that we have to know your word and the truth and the life and the hope that comes from it. May we respond with faith and humility and lay a foundation in our lives and for generations to come, a foundation on your word. Help us to learn to love it. Help us to learn to read it. Help us to learn to enjoy it and the goodness that comes when we trust it. Father, we thank you for loving us and giving us this opportunity that people around the world would only dream of having. May we not squander the riches that we have here, but make the most of them to be a blessing to the world around us. Amen.